Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show News. Now, putting together these news updates is getting increasingly difficult because there are so many stories, so many new cars being launched, so many breakthroughs in battery technology, in renewable energy generation, in grid modernization, in brilliant new technologies and systems we couldn't even have imagined 10 years ago. It's hard to pick the right ones, but here's a few I hope will quit your whistle. In this episode, big steps in battery recycling, hydrogen aircraft, Chinese BYD bringing smaller, cheaper electric cars to Europe, Tesla to build smaller, cheaper electric cars for the whole world. A single wind turbine churns out record amounts of juice and, oh dear, poor Toyota. Like the Fully Charged Show? Then you will love our six live shows being held around the world in 2023, starting with Sydney, Australia on March the 11th and 12th. Okay, let's jump right in. Now, we've talked about China a great deal on this channel, and yes, there are massive potential looming problems with China's relationship with the rest of the world, but the story we don't hear so much is how fast things are changing in China. The incredible strides they are taking, installing wind and solar, converting their transport fleet to electric, and all at speeds and scale the rest of the world cannot quite comprehend. So we're very lucky to have Elliot Richards on hand to keep us in the loop. And what we can confidently predict is that Chinese electric cars are coming to Europe big time. And they are all very well made. And you know, any government can add sales tax, but currently they are much cheaper than anything made in Europe. BYD is a company that has been around the electric vehicle space for a long time, but they haven't been widely known outside China. I mean, Elliot has shown as many BYD cars in the past few years, and now they are arriving in the European market in serious numbers. The BYD Seal is going to be one of the first models to be launched here. But it sounds like they're considering bringing the BYD Dolphin hatchback EV to the European market. The Dolphin is a small, much cheaper hatchback vehicle, closer to something like the VW ID3. It's not another massive, hefty SUV. Now, currently, you can buy a BYD car in Belgium, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. Right now, today, you can buy one, and you can get it very quickly. Early next year, these cars will hit Germany, France, and the UK. If they really are as cheap in Europe as they are in China, which I know that's unlikely, but it, this is a serious challenge for the European-based car makers. I think this is a very big wake-up call. Hello! Smaller, cheaper electric cars fill a massive yawning gap in the market, and they will be very popular. We know that from looking at our viewing figures. And while we're looking at smaller, lighter, cheaper electric cars, finally, at last... Tesla are talking about producing an entry-level, smaller, lighter, cheaper car. So maybe the message is finally getting through. CEO Elon Musk, you may have heard of him, has made it clear he thinks a future Tesla compact car is a good idea, explaining that the next platform will be smaller in size than the Model 3 and Y platform and can be produced at roughly half the cost. A couple of weeks ago, I did an after-dinner talk, something I do quite regularly, and that was followed by a Q&A session. And this one stayed in my memory because one of the questions was from a charming gentleman who said with great conviction that all these fancy electric cars are all well and good, and that's a quote, but we're just going to throw all the batteries into landfill. And he didn't ask if we might one day throw them into landfill, or indeed, are there any plans with what to do with them after they reach the end of their useful life? No, he said with great earnestness that we will throw them away. I suggested he Google Redwood Materials, as that was the only example I could think of at the time. But it did make me think, are we all living in an electric vehicle fantasy bubble? If we're digging up and extracting all these materials to make our fancy electric cars, and we don't recycle the materials, then we could easily end up in nearly as bad a mess as extracting and burning fossil fuels for 150 years. Or could we? 
So I worried about that until I saw some figures from Dr. Simon Evans, a recent guest on the Fully Charged podcast, which, of course, you should subscribe to because it's brilliant. Now, Simon is deputy editor at Carbon Brief and someone whose full-time job is analysing and reporting on the energy transition and the impacts of our energy requirements. Dr. Evans gave me a slightly different take on the mining argument that some pro-fossil fuel lobbyists and proponents use again and again. What about all the CO2 that's released when you make a battery? Well, it's true. It's true. No, don't try and fob over it, Llewellyn. It is true. We released 100,000 tonnes of CO2 on Earth, mining and refining lithium in 2021. 100,000 tonnes of CO2 just for lithium in one year. That is shocking. We released 170,000 tonnes of CO2 mining and refining cobalt. Seriously, I mean, that is a disgrace. But it gets worse. What about the 2,700,000 tonnes of CO2 produced mining and refining nickel? Well, OK, nickel is used in a wide range of different products, but it is used in electric car batteries. That is seriously bad, and it still gets worse because we released 26 million tonnes of CO2 mining and refining copper in 2021. Oh, my God. I mean, what more proof do you need? And they claim these electric cars are clean. It's disgraceful. It's truly offensive. And then we released 2 billion, 600 million tonnes of CO2 due to extracting and refining iron ore. OK, that may not be specific to electric cars, but my goodness, that is a massive number. However, it's still smaller than the 2 billion, 737 million tonnes released using natural gas. That's extracting it, transporting it, and burning it. Okay, then there's the real biggie. Oh, my life. We are dumping 4 billion, 221 million tonnes of CO2 in the process of extracting, refining, and burning oil. 4 billion, 221 million tonnes. And finally, top of the smouldering tree when it comes to burning stuff, the fuel the Industrial Revolution was built on, the stuff that should now only be in museums because children don't know what it is. I'm talking about coal, because digging up, shipping and burning coal vomits out a jaw-dropping 8 billion, 172 million tonnes of CO2 each year, in contrast with 700,000 tonnes extracting a substance that has a 15 to 25 year life in a battery and can then be recycled. So a bit of perspective there. Okay, so even with that perspective, we have to change the way we operate. We have to live in a circular economy where we don't just chuck stuff away. Battery recycling, is it really happening? Yes, it is. Now, here's good news from Europe on this. Hydrovolt is a battery recycling joint venture between Northvolt, the Swedish battery uh, maker, who we've also had uh, on the Fully Charged podcast, we mentioned many times in the show, and Hydro, an aluminium manufacturer on the path to becoming super sustainable. And they have started commercial recycling operations at their plant in Fredrikstad in Norway. Hydrovolt is Europe's largest electric vehicle battery recycling plant with capacity to process 12,000 tonnes of battery packs on an annual basis. The fully automated recycling process at Hydrovolt enables up to 95% of battery metals to be recovered from the batteries, including plastics, copper, aluminium and black mass, which is a powder containing the metals of nickel, manganese, cobalt and lithium, which will be supplied to Northvolt for further recycling and then making into new batteries. All the aviation we use around the world accounts for just 2% of the total CO2 uh, emissions. But that percentage is going to increase as we clean up the rest of the way we behave. Uh, electricity generating, if we stop burning natural gas, if we use electric ground transport, we start using actual green hydrogen, not some con artist grey hydrogen that's made out of natural gas that releases CO2 in particular. No, not that sort of hydrogen. Proper actual green hydrogen to make steel, concrete and fertilisers. 
So it's a small but not insignificant amount. Although this isn't going to make a hell of a lot of difference in my lifetime, I like to cover the emerging electric flight technology because it's developing so fast, much faster than I ever could have believed. And we've recently all been bombarded by big sweaty dollops of hydrogen is the future news. And 90% of that is utter utter nonsense or actual downright lies. Uh, but in crucial areas, we can and should, critically importantly, use hydrogen. And one of them is planes. GKN Aerospace have just announced a technological breakthrough. And I'm going to quote from them right now because there's no way I could make this up. They say, work to date shows that GKN Aerospace's developments in the fuel system integration combined with hyperconductive power network and motor drive systems will enable hydrogen electric propulsion to be scaled up much more quickly than was originally thought. Mm -hmm. They are talking mid-range hydrogen-powered aircraft capable of carrying up to 96 passengers in the air by 2025. That is really quite soon. I mean, that is crazy soon. They must have working prototypes right now. I wonder if they'd let us see any of this for the show. Hmm. OK, there are numerous wind stories doing the rounds, but this one caught my eye. Now, I, I recently went to the Houses of Parliament to attend an offshore wind conference run by Renewables UK. Yes, proper posh. And it was also on the day our latest prime minister took office in the UK. I mean, there was a time when that would have been a momentous occasion. Sadly, those days are long gone. I heard about the thousands of massive wind turbines being constructed at the moment before they are installed in the shallow waters around the UK. Over 50 gigawatts by 2030. And this is creating employment for over 100,000 people. We'll shortly be making an episode about how the truly gargantuan wind turbine blades are made for these monster machines. I'm just mildly excited about going to see that. I don't think the general public are really aware how rapid the technology of offshore wind turbines is developing and has improved in the last 10 years and just how much of our electricity is generated that way. Basically, at present, it's between 20 and 60%. Yes, there are days like today when over half our electricity comes from wind. We've just seen all the previous records smashed to fragments because just one, one single of these monster turbines, the Siemens Gamesa 14-222DD offshore wind turbine, has just set a world record for the most power output by a single wind turbine in a 24-hour period. That single turbine produced 359 megawatt hours. To put that in some kind of perspective, it's enough electricity to power a car like a Tesla Model 3 to drive around 1.8 million kilometers or 1.1 million miles. Or to put it another way, enough electricity to run a 100% electrically powered home for about 30 years produced by one single turbine in 24 hours, with no fuel transportation needed, no CO2 or particulates released, no fuel waste material to deal with for 10,000 years, and of course, very importantly, cheaper than any form of fossil burning or nuclear generation. So when dullards start trying to repeat some garbage they've read on QAnon or the Daily Mail or heard on Fox News saying wind turbines don't work, just ignore them. They'll shut up eventually as they switch their kettle on, boil it using electricity that comes from an offshore wind turbine. The big challenge, the big challenge for offshore wind is utilising all the power produced. Because basically wind turbines work too well and produce too much electricity when we don't need it. And we must develop systems to use all that clean power. By the way, don't tell anyone, but electric cars really, really help. Toyota. Amazing company. Uh, I, I had a Toyota Prius for years. I mean, they are the inventor of the physics-defying self-charging hybrid. It used to just be a hybrid, which is brilliant, but now it's self-charging. Uh, they seem to finally have had a bit of a Damascene conversion. If you're not sure what a Damascene conversion is, I'll save you the Google. It means a sudden and complete change in someone's beliefs as a result of witnessing firsthand undeniable evidence. It's a biblical reference. I did religious studies at school. I remember this stuff. Yes, Toyota, pretty much the biggest car company in the world, who have been missing from the rapid electric vehicle transformation happening before our eyes. 
They have fought long and hard to delay the uptake of electric ground transport. They have used their enormous financial muscle to influence governments and push their alternatives, meaning self-charging hybrids and hydrogen fuel cell cars. They are now in a bit of a pickle because, well, for starters, hydrogen fuel cell cars, like a like Toyota conceived them, are well and truly dead and gone. They're finished. The story is over. They're removing the hydrogen refueling stations because no one uses them, because there are none of no cars around. It's gone. Forget it. But in the past, they have made predictions of how fast the rollout of electric vehicles would be, as in they predicted it would be very, very slow. They were predicting that it would take many decades from now before electric vehicle sales were at a level that might make an impact on their sales. Hello! I wonder if they're regretting saying that now. All those predictions have been smashed to particulate level dust coming out of a self-charging hybrid's exhaust. So now they are ditching their original very, very slow plans for a few electric vehicle releases over the next five to ten years and are going through a complete redesign not only of the cars but of the entire manufacturing process they use to make them they are already so far behind the curve it's going to be a massive job catching up with the rest of the global automotive industry who have already invested trillions on new factories on new battery plants and materials purchasing and it's not as if toyota haven't had plenty of warning it's easy to forget that in the early days of tesla motors toyota played an absolutely pivotal role Tesla wouldn't be here now without Toyota. A decade ago, slightly more than now, Toyota took a large stake in Tesla and the two companies collaborated to produce a battery electric version of the Toyota RAV4. I drove one in California. It's a fantastic little car. I really wish they carried on making them. I believe there are some still on the road today. At the time, many Toyota engineers believed Tesla's technology was no threat that was the quote. Toyota discontinued the electric RAV4 in 2014 and sold its stake in Tesla in 2017. I wonder if they ever regret that. I mean, I just checked today. Tesla shares were trading at $21.53 in June of 2017. Today, in October 2022, they are trading at $224.60. Hey ho! Anyway, one last micro rant before we go. It is undoubtedly true that in the last few months, the companies that have installed and run large solar and offshore wind farms have made bigger profits due to the wholesale price of electricity caused by the spike in gas prices. I'm not defending that. But what is clear is the general public know it is gas, not renewables, that have caused these obscene rises in price in Europe. Not forgetting the massive interventions governments have made, which is spending our money to help us reduce our bills, which we will have to pay back through our taxes. And that intervention money goes to, wait for it, the oil and gas industry. Shell have just made £8 billion profit. That's about $9.5 million or euros in just 13 weeks, not this year, a profit rate of £3.6 million every hour. I leave you with that lump of misery unless you're a Shell shareholder, in which case, ching ching, happy times, go and play a round of golf. Before I go, here's a few of our amazing Patreon supporters who donate $10 a month or more. And in one sentence, we would not be here without you. Thank you. Thank you to Brian Smith, Malcolm McIver, Tio Han Hui, Luke Thomas, Connor Mumford, Maple Creations, Andy Bliss, Anders Olsen, Tim Humphreys, Ronald M. Hill, Dr. Duncan Westland, Platinum Delta, Jason Legg, Ricky Benici, Charlie Milner, Jan Detlef, Detlefson, Detlefson, sorry Jan, because it isn't Jan, it's Jan, Jan Detlefson, <laughs> got it in the end, Jason Emerson, Ian Derbyshire, Ted Trimble, and Martin Dweven, Dweven Vorden, Martin Dweven Vorden, there we go, I got there in the end, humiliating myself, uh, and I apologise for the mispronunciation of your names, and thank you so much for supporting the Fully Charged Show. We'll be back very soon with more fabulous episodes for you. Please subscribe. Please have a look at the Patreon link. As always, if you have been, 
Thank you for watching.